I judges, we are called X. Our team members are Tengi, myself, Evan, Glenda, and Robin. As you can see, most of us have not done Rescue Line before. So our approach to this competition was to use our individual skills to try out stuff that hasn't been done in Singapore yet. Here's our hardware design. Last year, we made many compromises because only EV3 sensors were used. Two color sensors were used for line track and green squares, but one problem was that the readings would change if the robot was lifted due to the ram or the speed bumps, making it hard to tune. Another thing is that the field of, the field of view of the array is narrow, so if the robot were to deviate too much from the line, we will not be able to refine the line easily. There's one more color sensor at the front to detect the color of the victims and the rescue kit, but it, the color sensor can't range, can't see very far, meaning that to collect all the victims, you would have to sweep through the entire evacuation zone, which wastes time. Hence, this year, we offloaded all detection of color to a USB camera. It has a low resolution to avoid wasting processing power downsampling the frame in software. It can still track over bumps and the RAM, because the black of the line still looks black, regardless of its height, and the wider field of view means that it can regain the line more easily and also gather more context about its environment. For example, in one frame, the robot can determine whether a green square is before or after a horizontal line and make decisions accordingly, reducing complexity in the program. For turning, an EV3 gyro was used last year, but like all EV3 gyros, it is susceptible to drift over time. Hence, uh, this year, we use an IMU, which includes a magnetometer and onboard sensor fusion in order to filter out the drift error in the final output data. In 2021, one ultrasound sensor was used to detect the obstacle and walls in the evac zone. Its sensing cone is very wide, which is good when we want to make sure that we can see an obstacle in front of us, but not when we want to know our distance from a far away wall accurately, because from a long distance, a lot of things can enter the cone like the walls next to the robot, causing readings to fluctuate. So this year, we use time of flight distance sensors, which use light for range finding, and have a smaller sensor cone for more accurate long range readings for localization. But we also kept the ultrasound sensors for obstacle detection, and also in case the obstacle is transparent and lets light through it. To process the camera feed, we use a Raspberry Pi 4, not the most powerful, but very well documented, which is important for debugging. To control the motors and read the sensors on time, we use a separate 3.5. Uh, we use a separate TNC 3.5. The actuators take up the most space in the robot, but we want the robot to be less wide this year so that it can maneuver more easily near walls and ram supports without bashing into them. So for movement, we use this DF robot motor because it has a built-in encoder and motor driver, so we don't have to create extra space for them and add wiring and complexity to our design. They are also small compared to similarly spec motors so we can save even more space. But one caveat is that they are also relatively low torque, so we have to make sure that everything else was as light as possible. For our claw mechanism, we use this clutch servo. To grip objects very tightly, normally you would have to stall the servo, but in normal servos this creates heat and could cause them to burn out. These servos won't burn out after being stalled, making them more reliable to use. They also have more than enough torque to grab the objects, so we don't have to gear them up like, uh, sorry, gear them down and add bulk and complexity in the process. Here's our electronics layout. The battery 12 volts gets regulated into 6 volts and 5 volts to power everything. The camera sends to data to the RPI, which processes and sends uh, the data to the TNZ. The other sensors all send to the TNZ, which controls the actuators. Next thing to decide is what drive base to use. One problem with tank treads is that the treads must skid in order to turn. So if I move my right tread forward, the pivot of turning could be anywhere on the left tread because the amount that the left tread slips depends on the surface and center of gravity of the robot, which can vary, making it hard to tune for line tracking. This year, we went with two fixed wheels at the front and two omni wheels at the back. So it still has the grip of four wheels, but because the back two wheels can move left and right freely, there is no slippage. The robot pivots like a two-wheeled robot, and the pivot is now consistent at one point when we want to move the right wheel forward, making it easier to tune for line track. For the camera, placement is very important. If we mounted it pointing forwards, most of the top half of the frame will be useless to completing the task, and the part of the line that the robot sees will be very far in front of the, far in front of the wheels, which is bad. If the robot had to navigate a tight turn and turn on the spot, then in the process of turning on the spot, it may also lose the vision of the line. Hence, we calculated the vertical field of view of the camera 
and tilted it downwards by half the vertical FOV so that it can still see to infinity but retains more useful information in the frame and sees the part of the line that is closer to the robot. Our claw has to pick up both the cuboid rescue kit and round victims well. To pick up the rescue kit, we space the arms apart such, uh, such that, accounting for compression in the foam, the arms grip parallel to the sides of the cube, maximizing friction between the cube and the claw. As for the round victims, we have two layers of foam tape with some empty space in between. This empty space gives space for the foam tape to compress and conform to the curved shape of the ball, resulting in better grip. Now that these key considerations are covered, for our main robot PCB, in short, we made everything as compact and dense as possible, also making the wheelbase much shorter. Then, we added holes to vent heat from the motors and Raspberry Pi, and an indent at the front to allow for the claw to recess into the body of the robot. All the signals and power distribution are done on this one board in order to cut the weight from wires and extra plates. To finish off the robot, the rest of the electronics like the battery, the sensors and cooling fan were mounted using 3D prints and the claw mount and storage mechanisms were also 3D printed. This approach kept the robot lightweight and easy to prototype, modify and repair. So that's all for hardware, moving on to software. Next, I'll be explaining our software design. We made sure to make full use of our camera, implementing vision to achieve the majority of our functionalities. In each loop, the camera captures a frame and the RPI processes the image. It then sends data via UART to Teensy, which controls the robot's movements. The data sent over are the speed, angle, and task. The angle we send over is used to calculate our steering rate, which reflects how much the robot should turn. For instance, if the steer is equal to 0.5, the robot will do a one-wheel turn with the pivot wheel stationary. If it's one, it will turn both wheels at the same speed in opposing directions. Normally, we cannot directly control motor speed, only the voltage applied to them, and the resultant speed is dependent on what load is applied on the shaft. But using the encoders built in our motors, we used an integral controller in a closed loop to automatically regulate the voltage of our motors to hit the desired RPM regardless of the load. This is useful when, let's say, one wheel is stalled by a speed bump while the rest are not. This system would boost the voltage to that wheel so that the robot moves forward instead of turning on that wheel. It's also useful for running at low speeds without stalling under increased load, like up a ramp, since the eye controller will automatically oscillate the PWM value sent over such that the average speed is the desired RPM. The TNZ controls our robot's movements using a state machine. Every loop, the TNZ receives the task value sent over from the RPI and instructs the robot to perform different actions accordingly. This code structure helped us to debug issues more easily, as well as improve the readability of the code. Whenever we add new functionality to our code, we will perform unit testing. We will first confirm software logic using IM shows and debug prints. Then we integrate different components together and test on as many cases as possible before we can confirm that the function works fully. Now for the line mission. This is our strategy. Starting off with line track. There are many possible approaches to line track we explored. One would be to detect lines using hue lines and instruct the bot how to move based on different cases. However, this is computationally expensive and only works for straight lines, not to mention all the cases we have to code in. So instead, we implemented a proportional line track as it is smoother, more efficient, and works for all cases. The robot's steering rate is proportional to error. If the line is further offset from the center, error is larger, so the robot will correct this position more aggressively. The angle is calculated by first thresholding black pixels to obtain a black mask and applying the mask to a pre-populated vector matrix, which varies based on the distance of each pixel to the origin, which we take to be the bottom center of the frame. Finally, we take the weighted sum to determine the overall output vector that determines the target angle. This way, no cases are required and complex tile patterns like the S-curve can be simplified, allowing the robot to cut through them as you see on the screen right now. For green square detection, we need to differentiate between squares that lie before and after the intersection. So we use hue lines to detect the horizontal line of the intersection. Then we crop the frame to obtain a polygon mask of the region below the line, and then filter for green pixels. Upon testing, we were pleasantly surprised to find that this worked for intersections involving the circular loop as well, despite hue lines theoretically only working on straight lines. If two squares are detected, the robot turns 180 degrees using the IMU. The turning speed is proportional to the difference between the current IMU reading and the set point, minimizing the time taken to complete the turn. Otherwise, when there is only one green square detected, the robot turns left or right depending on what side of the line the square is on, 
which is determined by comparing the X values of the green centroid with the line centroid. Since executing a false turn would wreck the whole run, we only turn while green is inside the frame, and once the bot moves past the green square, it should resume line track on the intended line. This means that any false green detection would at most only cause a momentary displacement. For the blue cube pickup, we first filter blue pixels. When the cube is still some distance away, the blue pixels contribute some vectors into the overall vector calculation. So the robot's line track will be biased towards the cube, making the pickup sequence easier. To compensate for this bias, we undo the movement after pickup so we can reacquire the line. If the lowest y value of the blue contour is below a certain value, the cube is deemed to be near enough to be picked up. To navigate the obstacle, the TZ checks if the front ultrasound reading is less than 12 cm. If so, the robot turns 90 degrees and does an arc turn around the obstacle until it sees the line again. That's when there are enough black pixels near a horizontal slice in the center of the frame. Then, it will reacquire the line and resume line track. Here it is in action. Wow. Finally, for the red strip detection, if the red pixel threshold is met, the robot stops and the run is completed. Last but not least, the evac zone. Here's our strategy. At first, it was hard to detect the silver strip as it is reflective. Color thresholding will result in an inconsistent mass. Hence, we decided to detect the grainy mass produced by silver on the left. Many pixels are erased for the silver strip's black mass or fewer from the black line. So we can check if the ratio of the number of remaining pixels to the original number of pixels is low. If it is low, a silver strip is present. However, our robot mistook the grid lines for start of black line as a silver strip, as they produce a similar effect. So, they are imposters. We overcame this by checking for silver only if there are sufficient pixels in the mask. This is because the silver strip has more pixels in its black mass than other lines. This solved the problem. If the silver strip is detected for more than five consecutive loops, the robot then searches for the balls. For the black ball detection, we obtain a black mass and draw a circle around it. The radius of the circle scales with the size of the block. We then filter pixels in the circle. If the pixel threshold is met, the robot picks up the ball. However, our robot mistook the deposit point for the black ball, as there will be many pixels within the circle mass too. Hence, we have to differentiate between a rectangular and round block. After drawing a circle mass, we drew a bounding square and obtained the mass with four corners. Unlike the deposit point, the ball won't have pixels within the corners as it's round. This managed to work. We adopt a similar approach for the silver ball. However, as the silver ball produces a greeny mass, we draw the circle from the ball's outline rather than the actual mass. Once a silver ball is detected, the robot picks it up. Here's our robot detecting and picking up the balls. Yay! After collecting the balls, our robot searches for the deposit point. Upon reaching the center, it turns until we see the deposit point. The robot then deposits the objects and exits the evac zone. You can see our deposit movements on the right. In the future, we plan to make these improvements to our hardware and software so that our robot will be more robust in external venues. And that's the end of our sharing. Here's the links to our designs and code. We plan to officially release them once we're done with some refinements and enjoy the rest of our run. Thank you.